In the last video, we were talking about defining addition with Piano's axioms. So if you haven't watched that video, you might want to go back and check that out. However, in this video, I will be talking about multiplication and how we can define that with Piano's axiom. So just to jog your memory by a little bit, last time I told you that we can define addition. So uh, addition as in the following way. So we said that if you if if you are working in some sort of natural natural setting, some sort of natural set, and it doesn't have to be the natural set that that you are used to, and that's denoted by this by this double double line uh, n. Uh, you could be working with some weird natural set, and we talked about how um, Russell defined defined one to be the empty set and the successor of one to be. Uh, so the, he defined the successor of this, so he of of the empty set as being the set of the empty of the empty set and so on. So you don't necessarily have to be working in the naturals that you are used to with. You could be working in any given natural set that you can prove with the axioms provided by uh, Piano. We defined addition uh, as in the, in, the, in the following way. So if we're, we are working uh, in, in this weird natural system, then we said that if you, we, we, we saw this property that if you have some number added to the successor to another number and this bear in mind that m is not equal to n in this so if m plus successor of n actually i should not put this just to because there are some cases uh actually let me actually this is a good good time to show you this we could have zero plus the successor of zero Right, and we talked about how this is equivalent. This is equivalent to me saying the successor of the added number plus uh, the number that we originally had. So this would be this. This would be equal to the successor of zero plus zero. Now you might notice. Well, you might ask, Rancy, why are you using zero? Zero is not an element of the naturals. And I repeat, we don't have to be working in the in the natural set that you are used to. And to again to jog your memory, the natural set that we will be using in our class is one, two, three, and so on. So it does not include zero. But this was just an example of how it could be equal. I could have I could have just as well said one plus the successor of one is equal to the successor of one plus one and please note please note that we can never we can never actually compute this because that would be assuming something in in real analysis we don't assume anything so the only way that you can compute something is if you have some so you have the successor of one number so only one value and why is that why are we allowed to do this and not allowed to do this that's because um, a few videos ago i defined to you that the successor of one is two and the successor of two is three the successor of three is four and so on so i defined it for you this so this was a definition Def, uh, definition. So the things about defin the thing about definition is that you don't have to prove this. You can just assume this. So that's what I did. I basically gave you the successors of all the different elements of the natural set that we are used to. So that's why we can only only assess one value, and that's why we cannot assume what the value is within within this. So. Everything that I have put in a box is very important and you want to note this. And if you haven't watched the previous video, let me just very quickly show you why Why do we have this. So the example for this that I gave you, that I gave last time was how do we know? So the problem is how do we know 2 plus 3 is actually equal to 5? So we start with the left side. So said 2 plus 3 is the same thing as me saying 2 plus the successor 
of 2. Then we apply this property that I just talked about. So we bring the 2 inside of the brackets, 2 plus 2. Now, as I was saying before, you cannot assume uh, that 2 plus 2 is 4. You have to use Piano's axioms. So um, 2 plus 2 is the same thing as me saying the successor of 2 plus the successor of 1 because I just defined to you that the successor of 1 is 2. So once you have this, we apply this property again, and I bring this inside the bracket. So we have successor of a successor uh, of 2 plus 1. So if we have the successor of the successor of 2 plus 1, and if you look very closely, if you, if you have 2 plus 1, that is the successor of 2. Think about what a successor is, and if you don't, know what it is let me let me show you what it is so if you have one right then the successor of one is two but what are you actually doing with 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 this function you're just adding one to it one plus one is two so two will be the successor of one and by the same logic three will be the successor of two and to go backwards how do we know this we take the the, the this value inside of the brackets and we just added a 1 to it. So 2 plus 1, 2 plus 1 will give you 3. Okay. Anyways, so that's the logic that goes behind this. And if you want to, if you want me to go uh, a little bit deeper and want you to explain it in much more uh, extensively, then please go back and watch the other video that I made. So as I just said, 2 plus 1 is the same thing as me saying the successor of 2. So this would be the same thing as me saying successor of 2. So now we have the successor of the successor of the successor of 2. So now, since we have one value, we know what the one value is because I have defined it for you. So what's the successor of 2? Well, that will be 3. So I can put a 3 inside. And let me bring that here. So what's the successor of 3? The successor of 3 is 4. And what's the successor of 4? It's 5. Now if you look at both ends of the equation, you will see that I have just proven to you that 2 plus 3 is indeed 5. So that was just a re review from last time. In this video, I want to show you that we have a similar, similar rule for multiplication as well. So let me actually define that for you. So if we have... So if we have some number multiplied by the successor of another, and it doesn't really matter if m and n are not equal, this is the, this is equivalent to me saying m times n, and we put that in brackets, plus m. This is very important because we can prove uh, multiplications through this method. Normal arithmetic uh multiplication that you probably learned in in your primary school or your maybe some of you who were were a little bit brighter maybe in grade school so let me give you an example for this because this might be getting too abstract for you so let's say the the, the test you you open up your test and it says how do we know that one times three so that's a one and I should, I, let me let me write it this way. 1 times 3. How do we know this is equal to 3? So do, do we know this is true? So how will we do this? So, well, we start with the left side. That's what we did for the previous example as well. So what you want to do is you want to say 1 times. So what is 3? I, before in the previous slide, and let, let me show you the previous slide, I told you that 3 is equivalent to the successor of 2. So let's go back. So 3 is the same thing as me saying 1 times the successor, the successor of 2. Now you will notice that this is in this format. And I just told you this is the this is equivalent to me saying this. So we can say that 1 times the successor of 2 is the same as 1 times 2. And we put that in brackets, plus plus 1. Now, you may know what 1 times 2 is. Actually, you should know what 1 times 2 is. However, you cannot assume that. You have to prove it, and you have to use Piano's axiom. So let's actually do that. What is 2? That We defined that in the, in the last slide as well. 2 is the successor of 1. So 2 can be replaced 
by by successor of one. So one times the successor of one. And we add a one to that. So now you may notice we, we are in the same position that we were before. So let me actually use green and I'm gonna take advantage of this, this scenario again. So M times the successor of another number or the same number, M could be equal to N, that doesn't matter. Then we can replace it by, by this. So don't confuse it, don't go outside of the brackets. These are your boundaries. So anytime you apply any of the laws that we talked about, then you have to apply them in the boundaries that you have made for yourself. So don't go outside of this. Don't, don't go outside of this. So, so this is equivalent to me saying, so we, we can reduce this into this, into this format. So we say, uh, we say one times one plus one and then plus and and then plus one now uh, we know that from if you if you haven't watched my generalized commutativity and associativity associativity video um, we can we know that one times one is one and if you if you are uncomfortable with with assuming this then well you can you can wait for the field axioms because in it's it, it's an axiom that if you are working in a field as if you are multiplying by by the additive um identity sorry the multiplicative identity which is one for us then the original element remains so if you feel uncomfortable assuming that anything, uh, well, one times one is one, uh, then you can wait for the for, for the field axiom. So at this point, at at this stage, we need we need to you know say that one times one is indeed one because I know you might be saying why well, well, well if it's a multiplicative identity why couldn't we have just said that here because we want to utilize Piano's axioms because this is a proof. Unfortunately for us, there is there is nothing that one succeeds. So, uh, so uh, because that would be the successor of zero would be one. So one cannot succeed anything because there's nothing behind behind one in the natural set. So we just say one times one is. We keep it one, and and then we say one plus one, and then we have this. We have this. Um, uh, bracket the these two brackets and then we have a, a plus one on the outside so uh, this so one plus one as I talked about before would be the same thing as me asking you what's the successor of one we th that's what this means so we can replace the inside part with that successor of one now when you see some some successor let me let me give you an example so the successor of one is two and if if i take the successor of one and if i were to if i were to add a one to it that would be what would that be that would be um the the, the successor of two which is three how, how do we do that uh, well uh think about this this is saying one plus one. That's what this successor function means. If you just add another f plus one to it, you're just saying, you know, th this could be by itself, by itself a successor because you're just adding a one to, let's say, one. So this is the successor of one. But if you add another one, you're just saying it's the successor of the successor of one. If you see two s's, you can in your mind think of the s as a plus one. So if you if you have two in here, then two plus one is three. Now, if we have the successor of the successor of two, in your mind translate the s to a plus one. So think about this. You can even put a plus one here. You can put a plus one here. So you can say two plus one is three. Plus one uh, is four. Uh, two plus one, yeah. So, does this make sense? Yes, we can even simplify this. We we can say successor of, uh, so successor of two is three, right? And then we know that the successor of three is four. So this does indeed match with with this. This is actually a nice finding, and you you can use this to 
to make your life a little bit easier. So think about the S as a plus one. Just translate that in your mind. Anyway, so we were talking about, we were here, we were saying that this is equivalent to me saying the successor of one. And if I add another one, right, this is equivalent to me saying the successor of the successor of one. In our proof, now that we are down to one value, we can we can we can actually compute this. What is successor of one? I defined this to you in the last in the last slide. The successor of one is two, and we know that the successor of two is three. Now, if you look at both ends, if you look at both, okay, and this was equal to this thing. This thing was equal to one times three. That's how I got successor of two. So now, if you look at both ends of our proof, you will see that. We have three on this side and we have one times one times three on this side. I'm sorry, the three got cut out. But we have just now proven that one times three is indeed three. And this is piano's multiplication kind of rule. And we talked about addition in the previous slide. And if you needed more, if you wanted me to go through it with more detail, then you can check out the an, another video that I did before this that explains it with, with greater detail. I hope this video was helpful.